So t- tonight, uh, hey, thank y'all for coming, by the way, on this holiday kind of weekend between here. I really appreciate you coming. So tonight I'm kind of doing a, a little educational thing. I do want to say thank you for those of you that are participating in the cleaning ministry. And uh, so uh, if you, we do have a few spots open. There takes about an hour a week, an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, you come in after Wednesday night and you kind of clean an area. You got your own key. You pray while you clean, right? Because you're cleaning to make the physical thing, but you're also praying that his church will be holy and have power. So if you're interested in being part of that, see one of the pastors, we, we could use your help. And it's not a permanent assignment. We help people clean for a while, then they step aside. And so I think it would be helpful. Okay, so uh, uh, tonight I'm, I'm doing, uh, uh, we're going to do some messages in the new year from the book of Luke. Uh, my favorite book, say your favorite book on the count of three. One, two, three. All right, that was wonderful. Uh, mine is James, <laughs> not because it's my name, because <laughs> he's a brother of Jesus, right? I really like it. I like it. But, uh, <clears throat> and uh, I mean, I, I, a lot of the books are very rich. I enjoy them all. But I think that uh, in, over time, I've kind of drawn toward Luke as the, my favorite gospel. But John has some things Luke doesn't that I really enjoy. But also, I'm really drawn toward um, uh, uh, Acts, and he wrote both of those. And so take a look at Luke as the title, a look at Luke. Let's just take a look at Luke for a minute. There he is. That's not the Luke I'm talking about, and that's not the Luke, but boy, he sure preached good a couple weeks ago. Our young pastors are getting coming along there, Pastor Zach and Austin, Brian this morning, and all those youngsters, and, and so I, I'm really proud of them. Uh, several years ago, about six years before we moved in this building, so it's about 11 years, the Lord just spoke to me that church in America is messed up because it's man-centered and that he doesn't want people following man. When people come in here, I, the Lord wanted me to start having other people preach and develop preachers and develop pastors and quit making it about one person. So it's been a little adjustment for some of you because you like my weirdness, but there's the, each of the other pastors have their own weirdness, especially Zach. Uh, he's got the, he, he's really, he's not my kid, but he's, he's weird like me. And uh, uh, so I, I like to hear him preach when he preaches, but I, I enjoy them all. They all do a great job. So uh, we're going to take a look at Luke tonight. And so a little bit of a, a history and turn to Luke chapter one. We'll be looking there in just a moment. And I want to just pray, Father, help me, Lord, to deliver this in such a way that people benefit and that, Lord, they see your plan and see how, God, you use individuals, everyday individuals, by your spirit to do a work that made a difference for eternity. And, Lord, we, too, have impact on lives like that when we're full of the same spirit, the same word of God, the same blood that was shed that saves us and that and that uh, the same life that's in us in Christ that was in Luke as he wrote these books, as he did ministry in his lifetime. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there's not a lot in the Bible mentioning Luke. If you'll notice also, Luke doesn't mention himself in either book. He's a very, very humble guy. But who was Luke from the Bible? Well, Luke's the only, only mentioned by name three times in scriptures, and all three references are in Paul's letters in Colossians 4, 2 Timothy 4, and Philemon, which has one chapter. Philemon, believe it or not, uh, mentions it. It's so small, you can't hardly find it in your Bible. Uh, how many have read Philemon lately? See, it's too small. You don't want the little stuff. You like the big stakes, right? Now, some of you raised your hand. That's good. But I, I will say, how many of you, well, I don't want to do that publicly. I hope you've been reading Luke. If you haven't, stay on it. There's no guilt in that. Keep reading and get to the end of Luke. It's a rich book that will impact you. I believe it will really change you in a great way. Uh, most biblical scholars support Luke as the author of these two books. And uh, we come to this conclusion because of the similarity of the writing styles and the vocabulary that's in both books. Another reason is that Luke used the term we several times referring to his missionary travels. Uh, in, he, he used that in the book of Acts. And though Luke was not present with Jesus during his ministry and likely was not a believer until after Jesus' resurrection, Luke's attention to detail and abundant eyewitness accounts 
serve him as a credible historian for the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, Luke's gospel contains several uh, parables and eyewitness accounts that are only in the gospel of Luke, such as the pre-birth account of John the Baptist with Elizabeth, etc., uh, that being to him uniquely. The story of the two men who met the resurrected Jesus on the road to Emmaus, you remember that, as well as the stories of many stories that are only in Luke. And there, all, the other books have miracles too, but the miracle stories that he records only unique to his, his gospel. It's the longest of the four gospels, the book of Luke, and includes the most healing stories showing his interest in and compassion for the sick. His gospel also uh, has the most detailed birth account and a more descriptive death and the resurrection account for Jesus. It's very detailed. The gospel of Luke and the book of Acts total 52 chapters, making Luke the author of one-third of the New Testament. How many of you knew that? The same as Paul, one-third in content. Not as many books, but the length of his books uh, is one-third of the New Testament. It's most likely that Luke wrote his gospel in 63 A.D. So we don't know exact year Jesus died. People will often quote 33 A.D., but that's because they have Jesus being born at zero and, you know, or one A.D. or something like that, which is not accurate. Uh, so, you know, it was, uh, and I believe there's good reason for the fact that he did write in 63 AD. He is so detailed in his writings, do you, can you think of ever be a possibility that he would write the Gospel of Luke and not mention in it the destruction of the temple was 70 AD that happened in Jerusalem. And since he doesn't mention it uh, as a detailed observant writer, I just don't believe there's any way that it wouldn't been, he wrote it before that historic event. Uh, and even though maybe a few scholars that don't know what they're talking about argue with me, I would say I'm correct there. Uh, why did Luke? Why did he? Why did Luke number two? Or the second thing is why did Luke write a gospel account? Well, Luke one he writes this in Luke one, turning there uh, at the beginning of Luke chapter one, and and I will say this: the person he writes to, this Theophilus, appears to be like uh, a uh, a Greek or a Roman official that he's writing to. And he's not just writing to him, but he's writing to many in the Greek world because him, him being a Greek. So here's, here's what he, he, he writes. He says, inasmuch as, and I've got, I'm reading, and it's, it's different up there, so, because that's going to be the NIV. This is a New American Standard Bible, which is the most accurate Bible, according to Dr. Nunley. And since I'm a Nunley follower, I'm going to go with that, okay? Uh, so those of you that think King James is the most uh, authentic and uh, right, uh, uh, you know, uh, translation, I would differ with you. There are several passages that are not correct. They're like, in my father's house are many mansions. It's not the word mansions. is not accurate there. No, even though you'd like to have a mansion because you're an American, it's actually dwelling places. So the NIV gets it right. Ding, ding. Okay. So inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, he's saying, there have been others write accounts, but I have a reason for writing my account. And he is trying to write basically an account that gives a defense, an apologetics for this story to pass it on, particularly to the Greeks, because he's Greek. And just as they were handed down to us by those whom from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully, and can you imagine how careful he did investigate? Listen, this guy's a doctor. How did you like to go to a doctor and he gives you, he says, uh, here's some medicines, uh, try them, take them whenever you want. Uh, it really doesn't matter, just kind of pick one out when you're not feeling good and just shoot it on down, see what happens. No, he's specific. When he gives the medicine for for our flesh and for salvation. He says, take up your cross daily. He's the only gospel writer that takes the words of Jesus and the intent there to say it's every day. Die to yourself daily. The others to just say, take up your cross and follow me, according to the words of Jesus. He's very specific. He's detailed. And he says, investigate everything carefully from the beginning to write it out for you in consecutive order. 
Here's why he's writing it. Most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. So here's why he's writing it. And, uh, uh, you know, he, 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 he uh, writing to the Greeks and Corinth. He's writing to, uh, he's writing to the, uh, the Philippians. He, 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 he preached in several uh, Greek cities, Philippi, uh, Corinth. Uh, he, he traveled with Paul. Uh, he, he, he was definitely converted and saved by the same blood of Jesus that saved us and filled with the Spirit by the same Spirit that fell on the day of Pentecost. It's interesting that he recorded that. I question whether or not because Jesus had ascended, by then he saw Jesus resurrected and became one, and came curious or heard and became someone that early on, perhaps he was, we don't know this, but there is a chance that he happened to be in Jerusalem at the time seeking this out and looking into this information that had spread throughout the world to see this, uh, this Jesus on the day of Pentecost. We don't know that to be for certain, but he definitely did his investigation and he was an intelligent person. He was, as I said, Lucas, or L-O-U-K-A-S, a Greek name, the, he was a Gentile. He was the morning he was a Gentile, the author of Luke. He writes in Greek style and he's highly educated with chosen vocabulary similar to other Greek writers in his day. He used Greek expressions rather than Hebrew versions, showing that he was more comfortable with the Greek language. We also know that Luke was a Gentile because of the way Paul addresses him in Colossians 4. And, uh, Paul named his Jewish co-workers first. And in verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 11, he says, these are the only Jews among my co-workers for the kingdom of God. And he lists them. And then two verses later in verse 14, he says, our dear friend Luke, the doctor, one version says beloved doctor, and Demas send greetings. So Paul is talking about that. And notice, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it, he's writing to the church at Coloss Colossae, the Colossians. Luke was the only Gentile to write a book in the Bible. And he clearly wrote his gospel with the Gentile audience in mind. He's sure, he is sure to point out references, listen, to creation. Because by nature they, won't, they didn't have the, the Old Testament where they believed in that. He, he referenced creation and Jesus' circumcision that every other Jew would know that they, they would be taken in for circumcision, but the Gentile audience wouldn't have known that. So he's the only one mentioning that on the eighth day he was circumcised. Uh, even, and, and so uh, the Jews would have known that even if it hadn't been written because of their traditions, the customs, the places, the Old Testament references would be able to understand the history of Jesus and the plan of salvation because it's foreshadowed in the Old Testament. So he's writing with a Gentile audience in mind. Don't you? I'm glad for that. And so Luke, Luke was a Gentile. Maybe that's why I really like the Gospel of Luke in that reference. Luke was also a physician. Though we can't be certain about every aspect about Luke's background, we know he was referred to by Paul as the beloved physician, a physician rather in Colossians 4.14. He likely had a, a comfortable life in Antioch, which is where he was born. And uh, uh, he, he, he's practicing medicine, but he chose to sacrifice that life and that life of comfort to follow Jesus. Henry Morris of the Institute of Creation Research shares this of Luke's physician background, and I quote, some commentators have noted that the ironical relation between Mark 5.26 and Luke 8.43, where Mark had said that a certain woman needing healing had suffered many things of many physicians. Notice how Mark says, suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. Luke, perhaps, being a doctor trying to defend his professional colleagues, merely says it this way about the same woman, that she had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any. That is, they had all done their best, but it was an incurable disease. It's a big difference. Isn't that interesting uh, to see his background as a doctor? Um, you know, God uses... Everybody from all works of life, from fishermen, carpenters, to builders, to doctors. I think we learn from that. And he wants to use 
use us. It doesn't mean we leave our profession necessarily. God uses all people. Let's put that in our, in our memory. The next thing I'd mentioned and referred to earlier was that Luke was humble. He never addresses himself as the author of either of his books. He never addresses himself by name as one of Paul's traveling companions, though he does use the term we when he's referring to uh, the missionary journeys. Uh, and uh, he never mentions his professor, profession as a doctor, or only Paul does that. And he never mentions his brother Titus. It's mentioned, Titus is mentioned there in 2 Corinthians 8 and chapter 8 and also 12. That Titus is Luke's brother. He does not mention the sacrifice he made in giving up his medical practice to travel with Paul and to care for Paul. Instead, he gives much focus to Jesus' healing miracles and Jesus as the great healer. The most important thing he wants his readers to understand, though, is salvation in Jesus Christ, where he really really quotes Jesus much he, he, about Jesus' words, repent. Just take a look at some of the words and some of the things and how he, he is direct. He talks about hell. He talks about repentance. He talks about salvation. He talks about spirit birth. So uh, Luke is giving it straight, and he knows the power of salvation in his own life, and so that's his theme. Gordon Franz of, of the Associates for Biblical Research states this, Talking of Luke, when he wrote his gospel and the book of Acts, he did not mention his name at all, nor did he mention his brother Titus. Dr. Luke was a humble person, and he didn't want to call attention to himself or his family, but rather he wanted to point people to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and to the work of the Holy Spirit in his church. And I think that's, that's a good thing. God doesn't like it when people start applauding man. We have a, a celebrity mindset in America and it would do us well as a church, and I've asked you to do this, that when you talk about New Hope Assembly, talk about Jesus being great. Talk about God's work through his people. Talk about all the people, the love of the people, the way the people are generous to help others, because that's what makes a great church. Then benevolence, to give the missions, to live a holy lives, to serve. And don't make it about the pastors, because that is elevating man, because the church isn't about pastors, and we shouldn't do that. Remember Paul and... Uh, 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 they, they, in 1 Corinthians, they are saying, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Paul, I'm of, I'm of this one or I'm of that one. And he says, wait a minute, we are nothing. He uses the weak to confound the wise. He says, stop that, bit, that bull, that bull corn. Stop it. Quit talking like that. That's wrong. We're not of man. Somebody waters, you know, somebody does the girt and somebody puts in some seed and messes with the toil and the, the seed, the, the soil rather, and t gets it ready for the seed. And then someone waters it and somebody, you know, weeds it and somebody comes along and begins to grow and they care for it. And then someone reaps the harvest. We're all co workers in the field of, of God. Amen? And that's Luke's lesson to us. He was humble. May we be truly humble. God resists the proud. proud. Pride comes before fall. How many great men of God that man thought was a great man of God who could raise millions of dollars and preach up a storm have fallen because of their pride? I'll stop there. Luke 4. Luke, I mean, not Luke 4, number 4. Luke met some of the apostles. By the time Luke was writing the gospel, his Holy Spirit had already inspired two others. Matthew and Mark had written gospels. It is reasonable to think that Luke would have interviewed them and investigated their writings. People believe this to be true. Luke would likely have traveled with Mark because remember Mark was one of the people that traveled with Paul. And we'll see later that Luke was with Paul and he was the only one with Paul as Paul had announced, I fought a good fight, I finished the course, I've, you know, I've, you know, I've kept the faith, there's a crown, he's ready to die, my departure's at hand. And right there at the end he's saying the only one's with me is Luke. All right, we'll see that in a minute. So what I'm saying is, but Mark had traveled. They had traveled, they both preached. And since Mark also traveled with Paul, it's logical to think that, that Mark and Luke knew each other. And since Mark and Matthew were buddies, then we know that I'm sure Matthew and Luke would have also met and got acquainted. And they would have shared many sources and, and shared stories and told different things. And Luke would have been exposed to these sources and therefore would have based his writings and existing narratives with eyewitness accounts added in that he gathered with the help of the Holy Spirit. He did not write his book just getting it from man. However, 
He talked to eyewitnesses. He did an investigated. He studied it out. He looked at it. He brought it together. The Holy Spirit led him to do this, to write this gospel, particularly to Greeks, those that wouldn't understand Jewish culture in, a, in words and in phrases that would captivate them and penetrate them. And I find them very penetrating. And it was the Holy Spirit that quickened his book. It's obvious. You can't read Acts or Luke and not feel the anointing, feel, feel, in Texas is feel, but it's feel, E-E-L, the Holy Spirit. By the way, about feelings, can I just say something the Holy Spirit was dealing with me earlier? That we are to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And uh, heart is not just feeling, it's also thinking. And uh, you want shallowness, then you just make church all about an emotional experience and a feeling thing. That's the last thing. In fact, the thinking, the word of God is the basis where it comes in and penetrates your mind. Your, then your thoughts control everything else, including your will, because you're renewed in your mind. And then your mind knows that the word says to worship him with everything within you. And so your emotion then is okay to release that. But never does the Holy Spirit come upon you and make you stupid emotionally. Right? You get so excited you jump off the top of a building like you're going to fly. There have been stories of craziness that have happened. Okay? That doesn't mean that you don't get excited sometimes to jump around. I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. I'm not talking about shouting. I'm not talking about crying. I'm not talking about, you know, getting real excited. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact that your motivation for your following God, and you, you, you like you're addicted to the high, to the emotion, right? So what you're looking for is emotion. No, we're looking for truth. We're looking for God by his word to enrich our lives, to be in us as light and life and strength and have the spirit of God quicken that so that when we leave the, the, the sanctuary, which is the safe place where the people of God and the presence of God is, and we go into the world and our feet hit the ground, we walk straight. Doesn't matter how, how high you can jump when the saints are around, it's how straight you walk when they're not there. Are you with me? So I, I felt like that was for someone, and I, and I, I, I meant, intended to put that. that that's that's uh, free there. That's not even in this thing, so uh, just keep moving here. Aren't you glad for our young preachers that stay on track? Okay, uh, so Luke traveled with Matthew, with Mark, and uh, so a lot of it, uh, but it was by the Spirit. Luke wasn't trying to write a new gospel. He wanted to record the life of Jesus as accurately as he possibly could for a wider Gentile audience, including a high Roman official named Theophilus. Okay, and I know that it wasn't just to Theophilus, but he had been talking to him, and so he wrote this book knowing that the Holy Spirit had led him to do so and that other Greeks and other Roman officials that the Roman world would hear. Okay, and you know, later, the Roman world, it became so uh, unbelievable, and, the, and the, they started killing the Christians there in Rome, and people scattered, and that's a different story. But Luke, the fifth thing I want you to see about Luke is only Luke remained with Paul to his death in 2 Timothy 4. Uh, and let me just turn there right quick, verse uh, 14. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And this is, again, like I said, just leading into this, uh, we're, we're, we're seeing that, uh, uh, ah, I jumped over to Titus, no wonder it doesn't read like I thought it's supposed to, these little pages, where he, he says, I'm, I'm, I'm already being poured out in verse six as a drink offering in time of my departure's hand, fought a good fight, finished the course, I kept the faith in, in the future there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness with the Lord the righteous judge will award me on that day and not only to me but all also all to all who have loved his appearing and then you jump down to verse 14 it says it's or, or verse number 11 rather it says only Luke is with me Paul says before that he talks about others that were there but they've gone and, and he says, he says to them, pick up Mark and bring him with you. He wants Mark to come see him. He was very close to Mark, for he is useful to me in service, uh, he says in verse 11. But only Luke is with me. Luke didn't go back. He didn't, he didn't leave. Even though there was all this pressure and people were dying, the others kind of 
took off. Not that they were chickens, but that was just God's way of moving them. And, God, and they were led by the Spirit to go other places and preach the gospel, but they were beheading and killing Christians there. So there's a lot of, 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 of persecution and martyrdom. And Luke stood there, and Paul knew his turn was next. He was about to have it, and he was martyred. By the way, tradition shows us or tells us uh, in the passing down of history that Luke was hung from an olive tree. He, he himself became a martyr. Okay, so Luke is with him. Uh, John MacArthur explains this, and I'm going to read a couple of long quotes from him, so stay with me here. Nero had cranked up the persecution to a high level, and Christians were paying with their lives. And frankly, many believers had fled Rome. And you know they might have had a reasonable motive to do that, to carry on to preach the gospel. It's not like they were just cowards, MacArthur says, but Luke didn't go. Everybody left, and there was a lot of desertion. Demas left him because he loved the present world, verse 10 says. And you do get the idea that some of the rest left in desertion in verse 16, where he says, may it not be counted against them. Some of them did desert. But not Luke, loyal, faithful, brave, long-term friend, fellow worker, companion to Paul, been with Paul over years and years and years, been with Paul over hundreds and probably thousands of miles of walking, and Luke was there. John MacArthur also writes, so I say next to Paul, Luke is the most powerful writing force in the New Testament, yet he is basically unknown. I don't think in my life I've ever heard a sermon about Luke, and that's why I'm preaching this one, because I had neither. His historical, have you ever... Preached one, Pastor Don, I bet you taught it in Sunday school, haven't you? Anyway, his historical narrative spans over 60 years. It starts with the birth of John the Baptist when he talks there in the forerunner to Jesus. It ends with the, with the end of the book of Acts, which is volume two of his writings. It ends with the gospel being preached at Rome, which means the gospel is extended to the entire world, known world. No other writer wrote so comprehensive of a history of Jesus and had his impact. No other writer goes all all the way from John the Baptist to the gospel, having reached the capital of Roman Empire. He's the most complete storyteller of the salvation of Jesus Christ in the New Testament, and he is mostly unknown to us. Quote, unquote, John MacArthur. Luke knew he wasn't, and I don't agree with everything John MacArthur says, so be careful there. Luke knew he wasn't the first to write about Jesus, nor did he claim to be. He wanted to write a gospel that shared the truth that had already been written before a wider audience. This is, as I've already said, he investigated every written and oral source that he could, and with the help and the Holy Spirit breathed inspiration, he wrote it, and it became the divine inspired word of God breathed through by the Spirit through Luke onto, with pen onto paper, onto parchment. Now, we don't know everything there is to know about Luke, but I think that's the way he would want it. He didn't write a gospel for fame or recognition, which is why he does not mention his own name in either books he wrote. Luke wanted to teach people about Jesus and salvation to all mankind. And I would urge you to take from his life, and to, as, as we, we're not going to preach verse by verse through Luke, but pull some stories as we feel led and put it together and preach in the book of Luke. So I'll be reading in there, but I would urge you to examine what you learned tonight about why the motive of what we do, everything we do, that it points to Jesus Christ. It's not about us. When I started this church on a personal note, this is a true story and my wife can attest, I was praying because I had met a lot of people that started churches and when they were gone, the church went down. And we have churches right now with star preachers that when they're not there, people don't show up the same. And when those people are gone, I'm curious what's going to happen to those churches. You ever thought of that? And right here in this city, we've seen other churches where there have been star pastors leave and the demise set in because people were connected to the human. The word, yes. Did they receive ministry? Yes but too much about one person, and it's very difficult. So I pray, Lord, I don't want this church to be about me. How can I, how can I make the church about the body of Christ? It's about all of us. It's not about a person. And I'm definitely not, this is a time I was 
that I was doing some things that were really right. And I'm definitely not a perfect person, and I've failed many times. But in this session, I was fasting and praying for several days, and God spoke to me. I said, I don't want it to be about me. And he says, well, I want it, I want it to be, the, the church is the people. I want it to be that. I want them to get that. And he said, well, listen, he says, you know, if, if you own the church, you have the key. If the people are the church, people clean their own houses when they're theirs, and they have keys to their own houses. So trust God and ask God to help them clean their own church and have keys. So I give a lot of keys out. If you're coming regularly and you have any need for a key, and we know you, we know your faith in Jesus, you can have a key. I'm not afraid. We got cameras, and we'll catch you stealing things. That was pure, 100% humor. It's the best I've got. But it's the truth. And as far as I know, other than accidentally people taking, taking coats, we haven't had thievery around here so far, thank the Lord. Not that it couldn't happen, but all things belong to God. And let me tell you something. It's amazing. No one believes 94,000 square feet is basically cleaned by volunteers. Now, we, in full disclosure... We have a coordinator that we pay to coordinate and to train new people when they volunteer. And when someone last minute gets sick, they come in and they'll clean that and we pay them for their time because it's not fair to ask them to do 10 hours a week and oversee that without some pay. And so when you see Julie Spencer for the last however many years, she's done that. And uh, we have in the past year, as she's got ready for missions, blessed her really good and ministered to her as well to thank her for the many, many years. And now we have a new person doing that. And uh, so that person makes the volunteer system work. It's just, there was just led of the Holy Spirit. And uh, so, you know, it's amazing. It's all, you know, when we moved over here, we had all this extra space. And I went, I don't know if we'll have people that can do this. So we just threw it out there. And within, within a week, every position was filled. It was amazing. You guys are the best people in the world, right? And I believe it takes humility to clean a church and pray while you clean and volunteer that way. You're right. My son and I, I put him through the toilet ministry for about two years when he was a teenager, and we would clean over there, and he learned a lot about that. And, uh, you know, I've done everything in this church when it started. I've done it all, mowing, you name it. You know, you name whatever it is there is to do, I've done it. I remember one night, Saturday night, the rains came in that little bitty building. We had our first little building. It was a 38 by 78. We, had, we were just about to build on it. We had taken all the eaves off, all the spouts off. The, there was no brick on it. It was black paper. People would drive by think we were closed. We really weren't. We were still having church, and the rains came. And our basement, the only place we had for children was how much water? About this much, Dale? In the middle of the night, and Dale came up, and he and I spent all night. I went home, took a shower, put my suit on, and I preached. So you young pastors that are a bunch of wimps, you can go without a night's sleep, and you can preach. Amen? You got to get tough, right? But humble. <laughs> but I will tell you, if you just do it God's way, it works out. And so I'm thankful for Luke, and I want to urge you to read the book of Luke. Tonight, we're going to spend some time just praying. We're going to put some music on back there. And I've had a lot of feedback that people like just some very soft music, nothing to, to distract them to start, you know, thinking about the song and uh, just come and pray. So would you stand with me? Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for men and women alike, prophetesses, deaconesses, deacons, prophets, uh, pastors, both men and women throughout Scripture that were used of you, both Greek, Jews, from every nation, throughout the history we thank you for the history that Luke wrote about Acts, the beginning, the Acts of the church, the beginnings of the church, and the move of the Spirit, and the miracles, and the outpouring of the Spirit. And tonight, Lord, let us believe this word as the divine inspired word of God, that just like Luke wrote in Acts 2, that the Holy Spirit came, put, the, put, put tongues of fire on, their, on them, and they spoke with spiritual languages, with with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance and filled their hearts full of your Spirit and empowerment and that salvation comes by the power of your grace to change hearts. I pray in Jesus' name that we would be hungry for this word, not just to come together and, and, and feel that moving of the Spirit as we sing, yes, that's good, but to take and educate ourselves. I pray you give a new hunger in the new year to our church to be in Bible classes on Sunday morning. We have so many good ones. Some of the best teachers around, Pastor Gary Walter, Pastor Don Hawkins, Dale Carey, so many, Pastor Jeff, so many that teach the word. We thank you for them, God. We thank you, God. 
Let your people be hungry to be students of your word, to know it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Do we turn this place, as Jesus said, my house will be called a house of prayer. So let's spend some time praying and be sure you thank those in the serving in the early childhood department for ministering to us. Amen.